we had to pull my email address and my phone extension off the website. It can't be listed because of the, the stuff that was coming. But so then they would send the administrative staff this stuff, asking them to send it on, and they would read it and they would, they would just say, Greg, I can't show you this. I would be afraid to look at my phone. You know, I would get up in the morning, I'd read my Bible, feed my cats, have my coffee, and then I'd start shaking because I knew it was time to turn the phone on. Um, there was one point where I had for six months straight, I cried pretty much every day, tears of, of sorrow, but often, often tears also of joy because I was, I was really experiencing God's smile upon me, even as I was just being beaten left and right. This is why I stay a show about faithfulness in the face of judgment, hurt, and betrayal. Today's guest is Greg Johnson, who is the lead pastor at Memorial Presbyterian Church in St. Louis, Missouri, and who is, in his words, the only senior pastor in his entire denomination who is publicly celibate and same-sex attracted. For decades, Greg kept his sexual orientation in the background, but a few years ago, Greg felt that God was calling him to start letting others in on that part of the story and to start speaking publicly about his experience as a gay celibate man in a conservative evangelical denomination. Although the members of his church welcomed and accepted him after he started telling his story, the hate and vitriol that Greg experienced from the wider denomination has been extreme. We wanted to give Greg the chance to tell a story and specifically to share with us why he's committed to staying when so many around him are trying to force him to leave. So uh, you grew up atheist, which is a, uh, a rather unique experience and story for someone who has had the sexuality issues that you have experienced within your church. So I want I want to start there, just kind of explore what that was like. I I knew when I was in uh, between sixth and seventh grade, I knew I was gay. You know, I'd, I'd had suspicions, but then there was a, a wedding reception. And uh, I could not take my eyes off of one of the groomsmen. And I remember uh, feeling a lot of shame, even though, you know, you, you know, being an atheist in the early 1980s didn't make you any more open minded about sexuality issues right. <laughs> as anybody else. You know, it was, it was a different time. And uh, and I remember it was at a, a Bible Baptist churches or independent Baptist churches fellowship hall that this wedding reception was. And I noticed people staring at me as I was staring at this guy. And I, I felt fear for the first time because I had, I had been told just earlier that day I had overheard that the groom had a brother who was gay who had been kicked out of the family because mm. they were Christians and they couldn't have a son like that. And so here I am in this fundamentalist church as an atheist kid realizing he's gay and realizing these people probably all hate me uh, and, and would kick me out too. Um, it was a traumatic time, and that was in the early 1980s, which was the height of the, the AIDS crisis. Um, 1983, it was 100 gay men uh, a, a week, I believe, dying of, of HIV, of AIDS, and then it was 1,000 a week by the end of the decade. And so even though I was very closeted, I was not in any emotional place to be able to talk, talk about it with anybody. You know, everybody like me that was a little bit older was terrified. and a little older than them were getting getting sick and dying, and there was no cure. This was before protease inhibitors in the 1990s uh, made it possible to live a, a normal lifespan with HIV. And so, so it's a rough time. And and through that time, you know, I went during during college, kind of had something of a um, a moral awakening. I would say, um, you know, I, I was looking at issues of justice and questioning whether there really is good or evil. Does human life actually have value? Are there real human rights in reality? And if so, where do they come from? Are they just something that we like to think is there? Or are they actually there? And, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, just wrestling through all these things, I, I realized I was, I, looking back, I was, I was sliding down the slippery slope of the, the moral argument to the existence mm -hmm. of God, that we have to have a way to distinguish morally and and if there is evil and injustice in the world, and that means there is justice and there is goodness, and that means there has to be a standard of goodness, you know, uh, uh, who was um, Jean-Paul Sartre, I believe, who said that without an infinite point of reference, no finite point can have any ultimate meaning. Mm -hmm. And and so I was in, you know, high school French class, like fourth or fifth year French class reading 
in French, the Théâtre de l'Absurde, exploring the absurdity of human life, if there are no moral absolutes and there are no norms, and I'm realizing, I'm, I'm sitting here doubting my atheism the way Christians doubt their Christianity, because I was just realizing this could not be lived out. Right. Uh, there's no way. And so I started thinking there had to be a God. I started thinking it might be the Judeo-Christian God because of the emphasis on a God of love. And because I had seen Christians sacrificing for the sake of, of justice. But um, it wasn't until college that I, I went and explored all the different Christian groups from a distance, tried to find one, and none of them really seemed like they'd be a good fit because there was like the Black Christian Alliance and I was white, and there was the Asian Christian Fellowship and I was white, and there was the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, but I wasn't an athlete. There was InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and that sounded like it was for athletes. And <laughs> and there was the Catholic Student Association and the Episcopal Student Union and the Baptist. I was none of those things. And, mm -hmm. and finally, it's a bunch of campus crusaders who nabbed me and uh, introduced me to Christianity in a way that I absolutely did not understand a word they were saying, but got into relationships with them and into a Bible study. And and within about a month, I was a Christian. Okay, so you're in college, uh, you're in crew. What are you, what are you wrestling with there as far as, you know, what does it mean to be a good human? What does it mean to be flourishing? All those kinds of questions. Yeah, you know, it was, it was really, my sexuality was not at the center of it at that point, mm -hmm. really. It was it was me discovering Jesus and realizing that, that you know, sinners were the only class of people that Jesus came to save. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty good news, you know, because I, I knew I was a sinner. And in learning to really believe the good news, because I remember before my conversion, before I understood the gospel, there was a season where I was begging God to forgive me all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Lord, forgive me for, for being gay, forgive me for, for masturbating, forgive me for lustful thoughts, forgive me for uh, calling so-and-so this or that or whatever I call them. And you mm -hmm. know, I just had that, that, but I never had a sense of peace. And, and I remember mm -hmm. in, in that first year of college, coming home from a Bible study on how to be sure you're a Christian, and I wasn't sure I was a Christian. <laughs> I was sure I wasn't actually, uh, and, and I wanted to be. And I remember for the first time, I wasn't begging God to forgive me. I was thanking him for forgiving me and forgiving me eternal life and thanking him that Jesus had, had, had carried my sin to the cross and paid it in full for me. And, and then learning about, you know, the double imputation of justification that Christ's righteousness has been credited to me, which, I mean, that means it's less a, it's, a, it's as if, you know, I had fed the 5,000 and raised Lazarus from the dead and always did what pleased the father, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's liberating gospel. Uh, and, and I had a very powerful experience of shame before I was a Christian. But but one of the surprises was the degree to which my shame lessened after my conversion. I kind of expected it to go up. Right. Um, and I was just willing to pay the price because <laughs> that's because I didn't understand what Christianity, what the gospel was at, mm -hmm. at the time. Um, because you know, gay men, I mean, you know, Alan Downs talks about in his book, The Velvet Rage, he he talks about the velvet rage of uh, shame and self-loathing that in particular gay men of a certain age all experience. And, uh, and even when we, you know, throw off the veils of morality and say, there's nothing wrong with my sexuality. I'm was born perfect. The, the reality is we're still desperately trying to address our shame by making ourselves lovable. And so you look at every, every, um, Every field has, you know, art, culture, literature, music has a gay man at the top of the field somewhere because we are driven to perform enough to make ourselves lovable, to be successful enough to be lovable, to be attractive enough to be lovable, to be youthful looking enough to be lovable, to have a nice enough wardrobe, uh, an amazing condominium, an over-the-top cocktail party, whatever it is, we're, we're always driven to way overdue just because we're trying to make ourselves lovable. And and what Jesus gave me in the gospel was he didn't make me lovable, he made me loved. And that was better than being lovable because that, that gives me an identity and a relationship that cannot be taken away even by death. And so, um, yeah, sometimes people are like, gosh, Greg, you're, you're almost 50 years old and you're still a virgin and you've never even held the hands with another guy. You kissed a girl once and you didn't like it. Um, don't you think you're missing out? And I'm like, I don't think I'm missing out on much at all. Like I've got Jesus Christ, the son of God. I'm going to live forever. I've got, you know, I, 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 I have the freedom to be a failure. I have the freedom to be a sinner loved by Jesus and trying fitfully to try to walk with him. And so, um, yeah, I have no regrets on that front. So 
if I'm remembering right, your story in Christianity Today, you came out to a friend and crew, right? Uh, like a mentor role Yeah, almost. he's one of the staff members who was discipling me, a guy named Bill Reichert. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was the first guy I ever came out to. And, um, and he was great. He loved me. I mean, mm-hmm. he had already been loving me. It took me forever to trust him enough to tell him. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I, shortly after that, I, I told my, uh, my, my best friend who, who's still a very close friend and, uh, and then started telling other people with the ministry, a number of people. And it felt like a huge burden being lifted off. I, yeah. I, I did not think of it as a coming out more as a letting other people in, um, you know, cause it wasn't this, proud celebration of my sexuality it was just i'm gonna trust god that his people won't hate me if if i let them see me as i am yeah so good responses up for at, at first i assume in the mix of that though I, i'm thankful for that i'm thankful that you had someone there because a lot of people don't a lot of people do come out and that's a story i've heard a lot of they come out to somebody and then um you know, the person does stab him in the back, does turn on him. And I'm so thankful that wasn't your experience. Well, that, but it that, that was also my experience. You right. know, that wasn't not the people closest to me, but I remember one friend in, at, at UVA where we're driving the car and I, I said, Hey, I just want to tell you this is part of my story. And I'm starting to tell people and uh, I never saw him again. He just mm-hmm. totally bolted. I remember in seminary, um, you know, really a mature prank call from some other seminary students that was really pretty hurtful. You know, there were always experiences and I, I learned over time to be judicious, to, to not wear it as a badge or a label, but just be very careful who I shared it with. Yeah. So that there were always people who knew so that I was known, but so that it wasn't something going ahead of me. And and that really only changed in the last several years when I felt like God was actually telling me to, to share my story. you know, you kept it kind of private in a public way. You always had people who knew, who knew you, but it wasn't a public thing until later. So what was that, what was that process for you? Yeah. You know, it was about 2015 or 16. I remember I was having coffee with another pastor, a friend of mine, and he challenged me that that part of my story, the same sex attraction, whatever you want to call it, that that's a story that needs to be told. And when he said that, I, I told him all I could see was all of the, the money and the members leaving the church. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. sure. Um, you know, it's, I mean, I'm in mean, a, a PCA church. We're a very conservative denomination, Presbyterian mm-hmm. Church in America. And, uh, but I, I told him, he pushed back and I told him I'd pray about it. And about a year later, God had started, I had just been praying just myself. And God had started showing me, you know, this could help people. There are people who need to hear this story, Greg. And, and so after about a year, I went back to him and told him that I was going to start getting other people praying with me. And I got a number of, you know, a dozen, two dozen, maybe more pastors and elders and mentors and counselors kind of gathering around me, praying for me and praying with me, some from a distance, some locally. And I remember um, there was one point we were, there were about six or eight of us praying about it in my, my living room. And one of the older pastors, guy in his 70s, spoke up and said, Greg, I just need to make an observation. We have no longer been praying about whether you should tell your story. We are now praying about when and how. And that was kind of a key moment. And that's when I went to my session, my elders, and said, okay, guys, this is, we think this is going to happen. Don't know when, don't know how, but I need to make sure you're also praying. You're also on board. And they were, and they did. But it was about a two-year two-year process before I was ready, and and that's when um, you know I, I shared my testimony in Christianity Today in uh, May of 2019, and the previous Sunday shared it with my congregation 
Um, we'd given them a week's heads up of what was coming by video, you know, about five days in advance. And it was really interesting because the place was packed. You know, it wasn't just our folks who showed up. Others showed up as well. And I, I shared my story uh, in lieu of a sermon. And then at the end, walked down to the the, the Lord's table where we, we always, uh, you know, do the Sursum Corda, which is the, the, the preacher says the Lord be with you and the people respond and also with you. And, mm-hmm. and historically, the way that works is, is if the congregation does not respond back with also with you, then the service ends at that time. And because you can't go divided to the Lord's Supper and you just close in prayer. And we explained our people to that. And I said, the Lord be with you. And they shouted back and also mm-hmm. with you and just about blew me over. Yeah. Um, uh, and then the elders read a, read a, uh, uh, a letter of support signed by every single elder in the church of, of their support for me. And they were standing by me. And that if anybody had any questions, they could come to any of the elders to ask. And, and when I finished the sermon, actually, the, the congregation gave me a standing ovation. So it was mm-hmm. beautiful. There were people who left, though. Often it was family pressure, family members not wanting them to be in a church like that with that kind of pastor. And so we lost some people, but we also gained some people who were looking for a church where it's safe to be a sinner loved by Jesus, where we understand we're all in process. So that's that's a big testament to the leadership that you and, and the others had there, that that they were ready to do that. I think that's beautiful and awesome. And I'm, I'm thankful for that, for that story. Now, since then, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's, but I wanted to highlight that part first. <laughs> it's been five years of trauma since then, right? You know? I'm, right. I'm on multi anti anxiety drugs these days. I haven't ever had a problem with anxiety. Yeah, I mean that's that's a that seems to be, and you know, I'm only heard two of the stories, but that seems to be sort of the pattern that you're getting, where you're getting a really strong foundation of love and support to then walk into this other arena where you're not getting that. You're you're bearing a cross that is heavy. And it's it's hard. So, but if you're comfortable with that, I'd like to, I'd like to talk about the trauma now, which I know is not fun. <laughs> yeah, it's been pretty significant. You know, um, back in 2018, uh, our church had hosted a, a conference called Revoice for same-sex attracted and gay Christians who are committed to the biblical sexual ethic. And as senior pastor of the church that hosted that the attack from the right wing of evangelicalism was vicious. I have never seen non-Christians act so hatefully and with such slander and deception and cruelty. I mean, it was, I remember being, this was while I was in process still of figuring out how to share my story, being outed on a podcast by some guys in Moscow, Idaho, who, who knew people who knew my story and were going to expose me and and did so and you know i remember the day after it came i had a meeting at a local pub with our seminary interns every week uh monday evenings and and all of them showed up for the first time ever because they all knew what had happened and they just wanted to show me support there was abuse um people on twitter die fag die was one of the tweets that i got one sunday morning right before i got in the pulpit coming from an angry presbyterian down in georgia or south carolina i guess i saw south carolina you know the the steady stream after my story came out in in christianity today uh the steady stream of of nasty emails that you know the church staff would get and they would have to read my we had to pull my email address and my phone extension off the website. It can't be listed because of the, the stuff that was coming. But so then they would send the administrative staff this stuff, asking them to send it on. And they would read it and they would, they would just say, Greg, I can't show you this. I won't show you this. I'm deleting this. You cannot mm-hmm. see this. I would be afraid to look at my phone. You know, I would get up in the morning. I'd read my Bible, feed my cats, have my coffee. And then I'd start shaking because I knew it was time to turn the phone on to see what's in my email, what's on Facebook. Uh, what's on these kind of reformed Facebook groups? Right. What's, you know, what's on Twitter about me? What, where about my friends and misrepresenting them? Um, there was one point where I had for six months straight, I cried pretty much every day, tears of, of sorrow, but often, often tears also of joy because I was, I was really experiencing God's smile upon me, even as I was just being beaten left and right by people who I did not know. And my friends, for the most part, were being silent. You know, it was something that Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. said, which 
I'm not the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., but but he said, uh, at the end of the day, what you remember are not the words of your enemies, but the silence of your friends. And so many friends of mine had just ghosted. They, or they would offer private personal support, but never speak out publicly because they didn't want to get beaten up too. Uh, or they didn't want members of their church cutting, giving, or you know, right. leaving, or criticizing them. I requested investigation from my presbytery because there were these other regional presbyteries, regional bodies with our denomination sending all this, this accusatory stuff. And so I requested an investigation and my presbytery exonerated me, but it was about a 300 page report. And, you know, there were a few things I, I should have done better, could have done better. And then there were further demands from within the denomination that I be tried. And so I was investigated again. And it was, again, hundreds of pages in a report, um, just so much questioning. And these are years long investigations. And, and again, the press tree found there was no basis to charge me, you know, based on my doctrine or practice. But, you know, one of the accusations against me was that I, I was, uh, diminishing my identity in Christ by identifying as a same sex attracted man. <laughs> you know, like, well, I am that, you know, <laughs> right. right. Um, but I, 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 but they found no basis in which I was diminishing my, mm-hmm. my identity in Christ through that. Uh, so then that was appealed to our denominational Supreme Court and, and they ruled, um, last October and exonerated me by a supermajority. And that's a final ruling that can't be overruled, but it was, uh, not a unanimous vote. Even there, it was almost a third vote mm-hmm. voted the other way. Having ruled that out, now there are people in my denomination who are trying to change our church constitution to prohibit those who identify as same-sex attracted, gay, or homosexual from, from ordained ministry. And there are certainly there are some people who are supporting the amendments, these changes for other reasons, but the people who really dislike me, they're what's what's driving them is that they want to change the constitution to make it so that I can't be here. Right. And so, you know, they're just the thought that, and they have to get two thirds of the regional presbyteries to vote, but they're getting a lot. And the fact that probably the majority of elders in my denomination right now are kind of voting to say, we're not sure you belong. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's a betrayal that, um, that can't be minimized. Is that this summer when the final vote is on that? Yeah, it's going through the presbyteries now, and so um, we'll know if it doesn't get two thirds of the regional body's support, then it dies. Mm-hmm. Um, we won't know that for several months, and if it does get the, the two thirds, then it'll be this summer in Birmingham, Alabama, the next general assembly, and I think that only requires a majority vote. So yeah, it's a hard hard time, and it was fine when half the people in my denomination knew that I wasn't straight. But I wasn't public about it, and so they were fine. It's only when I said it publicly that it became an issue. And that and that says, I think, a lot about the state of religion in America. They're fine if you're secret. <laughs> They're yeah. fine if you're closeted. But uh, they don't want you, you. You need to stay in your closet um, or else we're coming to get you. And that's sad because that's yes. the opposite of what the gospel does. Are you the only publicly gay celibate? I mean, all, all the, the different descriptors we have for you uh, in the PCA, pastor, as far as you know? I am the only senior pastor of a PCA church who is publicly celibate and not straight. Okay. I'll say that much. There are plenty of mm-hmm. pastors and elders in my denomination who are right. not public about it because mm-hmm. they often, and often it's harder for them if they have a wife and children, it's harder for them to be public about yeah. that part of the story without embarrassing their family. Is there regret about going public at all? No. Why not? Because I believe God called me to do it. Mm-hmm. And he didn't call me to do it, promising me that there would be no suffering involved. You know, we make decisions 
oftentimes today in ways that are very different from the way people used to make decisions. You know, we may make decisions based on what we like. I like this. I'm going to believe that. I like this. I'm going to do that. But you look at like St. Paul. He hated Christianity. He persecuted the Christians. He was there at the stoning of Stephen. He hated Christianity because he hated the way it mixed genders, men and women together, the way it allowed unclean Gentiles into gatherings of believers, the way that it downplayed the food laws and, and seemed to place less emphasis on the Torah and seemed to be elevating the teachings of Jesus who, you know, who, and, you know, just he hated everything about Christianity until Jesus appeared in person in front of him and knocked him off the horse. And then he said, this is different. This is real. I have to deal with this. And so he changed what he believed based on what was true. And that's kind of how I've gone about this. This is why I'm a Christian, because it's actually true. It's not a make-believe. It's not a story. It's the, it's the reality that all the stories long for. And I went through a two-year process of discerning what God wanted, and he changed my heart on that completely and gave me a lot of confirmation from a lot of people that, yeah, God is, this is something God's doing. And so, um, you know, I've never been afraid to be a martyr. You know, I mean, we're all going to die and go be with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I can do it in a way that, that helps other people, I certainly want to do that. But, um, you know, a week doesn't go by that I don't get a pastor or someone calling me because their kid or grandkid or some kid in their church has just come out as gay or bisexual and they don't know what to do and they wouldn't have known where to look for. And so if, if I can help them, I want to help them. And, yeah. uh, and the number of people who I've seen who have been encouraged makes it absolutely worth it. The, the main question of this podcast, why, why are you still here? Why are you still PCA? Why are you still a Christian when, you know, you've seen both sides of it, but it's like you said, the last five years has been extremely difficult. So why, why stick around? What's in it for you? Well, I can't make any promises about denominational affiliation just just because I may not have much of a say and, and there's been a lot of damage that's been done already. Mm -hmm. You know, I think my denomination has shot itself in the foot in terms of having any positive credibility to its witness. You just can't do the things you've done. I mean, it's been all over the media, all over the world, you know, Washington Post, Washington Times, Religion News Network, uh, USA Today, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, even like Australian newspapers were covering what happened at General Assembly this past year. So it's, it's out there. And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm praying that God will just provide for the PCA and provide for us and for me and just, just give discernment and know what's healthiest. But I can't turn my back on the church because it's the body of Jesus. If through God's providence, I end up in a different denomination, a different corner of the church, that would be because I was extracted out of one and, leaving as a refugee to another that will take me. <laughs> but uh, Christians, our first membership vow is that we're sinners. You know, I promise that I'm a sinner in the sight of the Lord, you know, without hope, saving his sovereign mercy. And, and that's the one vow that Christians are really good at keeping is that we are sinners and we don't mm -hmm. stop being sinners. And so for me, you know, when I'm sinned against, I look at, all of my sin that, that God has forgiven. Uh, it's a trillion dollars worth of debt. And, and so, yes, yeah, some Presbyterians owe me a couple mil, but you know, that's pretty small compared to the trillions that I've been forgiven. And so, so I'm going to do what Jesus calls us to do. I'm going to pay their debt down for them through forgiveness because we're spiritual family and, and I can never forsake the bride of Jesus. I can never say to any part of the church, I don't need you because we're, we're family. And that's what Jesus did when he, you know, when he was teaching and his, his uh, disciples came up to him and said, Lord, your mother and brothers are here. In a family-based, clan-based, honor-based culture, Jesus was obligated to immediately stop teaching and go to his mother and brothers out, out of family duty. And, and he refused to do that. And he redefined family and he said, look around you, who are my father and mother and brothers, but you who do the will of my father in heaven. So that the church in the eyes of Christ, the church is family. We're mutually obligated to one another. And, and the reality is I can't give up church without giving up Jesus. You know, people think they can, but the reality is it doesn't go well because when God saves us, he calls us to be part of the body, the church, even the imperfect, painful, difficult, 
body of the church. I, now I tell people if their church is abusive, get out and find another church because you need a church where you'll be given the gospel, not where you'll be, you know, grist in somebody else's power and control need. But I look at Jesus and, and, you know, I often feel like I'm a guy who, you know, I saw a field with a buried treasure and I sold everything I had and I bought the field and I'm really happy with my field. It's Mm -hmm. Jesus is that treasure that's worth everything. And so I couldn't ever do anything to dishonor him in that. I love Jesus. He's, he's forgiven me everything. He's clothed me and, and I want to see his face. So Mm -hmm. that's what it boils down to. I know Mm -hmm. I am the biggest sinner in the room and I, I am not in a position to judge anybody. I can, I can, Tell someone when I think they're wrong or when my perspective is different, I can confront them if they sin against me. I can forgive them when they sin against me. If they seek forgiveness, we can be reconciled even and and begin living in love again. But I can never judge them. I can never condemn them. And if there has to be a departure, it will be a sad departure, but to another corner of the Lord's family. What's the difference for you? Uh, between enabling and influencing. So like in your context for someone who is, you know, they just go to a, a PCA church. Well, here in my city in Colorado Springs and um, they they saw an RNS, what's going on with you. How do they know whether they're attending this church is forwarding this harm, you know, and, and helping further it that's being done to you and people who are with your same story or similar stories or if they're being able to influence the denomination to become more accepting and open and loving. What is that? For you, what's that line look like? Yeah, well, I think for for others, they need to talk to their pastors and tell them what's on their mind and and see how that goes. For me, right now, I know I am in a position of of having influence. You know, I just published this book on the history of you know the past fifty years of Christian evangelical Christian interaction on sexuality, homosexuality mm-hmm. specifically, and gay people. And a lot of people are reading it right now, and I've. I've God's given me some platforms in Christianity Today and USA Today and other places to be able to speak. And so um, I feel like I've got some, God, God's put me here for a reason. And if he wants to slide me to a different location, he's the chess master. I'm, I'm just the pawn. He can put me wherever he wants me. But yeah, now if somebody is in an abusive church and they're not in a position to be able to impact it, which typically they won't be, then, then there's a time and a place to leave. But yeah, I'm, I'm the kind who really values being very slow to become angry <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and leaving room for God, God's Holy Spirit to work. Yeah. Again, thank you for the time. Where can people find you? Yeah. If you look at the stilltimetocare.com, that'll take you to my book, tell you a little bit about me. Um, you can also find me on, on you know Facebook and Twitter. PCA Memorial on Twitter, but uh, yeah, look at stilltimetocare.com and uh, I'll tell you everything. Why I Stay is a production of the Pathios Podcast Network, where we explore faith and gain understanding. Please consider leaving a review of this episode on either Apple or Spotify. And while you're at it, share your thoughts with us about this episode in your review. Also, consider sharing this with a friend or loved one who you think may benefit from this conversation. Greg Johnson's story is one we all need to hear, and I'm glad that he's telling it. While I'm deeply grieved by the backlash and betrayal Greg has experienced in recent years, I am simultaneously astounded by Greg's immense courage in the midst of profound opposition. In that way, Greg is an inspiration to me, and I hope to you as well. Greg Johnson's latest book, Still Time to Care, What We Can Learn from the Church's Failed Attempt to Cure Homosexuality is available now just about everywhere books are sold. This episode of Why I Stay was produced and hosted by John Osborne, and it was edited, mixed, and mastered by me, Clinton Battles. Clinton Battles.